Good morning everybody, this is Stephen Pugh of the Home Bible College. I want to do another um, video in the series on the King James Version Bible. And we're in chapter 7 of this book. This is the, um, in the beginning, the story of the King James Bible by Alastair McGrath. And we're going to be referring to it quite a lot because he goes into a lot of very important detail. So the decision to translate uh, and the Hampton Court Conference. Now, even as he travelled to London to prepare for his coronation, James found himself under pressure from the English Puritans. They'd long been irritated, irritated by what they regarded as the compromises of the Elizabethan settlement of 1559. Elizabeth had retained bishops and the distinctive robes of the clergy, and they were widely seen as vestiges of popery and Puritans and Hopeland had hoped that they would be eliminated in the country. Now Elizabeth's long reign, she, she reigned for more than 45 years, caused them considerable distress, but her death in 1603 seemed to throw open the door to Puritan aspirations. Um, so James VI's own religious views were similar to their own and many English Puritans therefore looked to James as someone who would be favourable to an established Presbyterian church. Now the lobbying began very early even while James VI was travelling down from Scotland in 1603 he was met with a Puritan delegation and they presented him with the Millery Petition. Now the Millery Petition the Millery Petition was a, a petition signed by over a thousand uh, ministers. That's why it is referred to those words. Um, and then uh, let me read a little bit of it. It says, Now we, to the number of more than a thousand of your majesty's subjects and ministers, all groaning as under a common burden of human rights and ceremonies, do with one joint consent humble ourselves at your majesty's feet to be eased and relieved on this behalf. Our humble suit then upon your majesty is that these offend that these offences following may be removed and some amended and some qualified. So they're petitioning him even on his way into England and they list four broad things. The first thing is the removal of, hu of the burden of human rights and ceremonies. The second thing was they included the practice of making the sign of the cross and the wearing of clerical dress and the use of a ring in the marriage service and the bowing in the name of Jesus. All these unbiblical things, they argued, should be removed. This is what they say. They say these are such other abuses yet remaining and practiced in the Church of England. We are able to show to be not agreeable with Scripture if it shall please your highness father to hear us or more at large by writing to be informed or, or by conference among the learned to be resolved and yet we doubt not that without any further process your majesty of whom christian judgment we have received so good a taste already is able of yourself to judge in the equity of the cause now the bishops of the church of england when they heard this has happened, they were furious, absolutely alarmed. They were alarmed because they could see that if James could be persuaded, then their uh, position as bishops would cease. And the Puritans, they had ceased the initiative. And, and they also, uh, James had decided to end the practice of inappropriate tithes, a long-standing tradition, meaning the funding of bishops, from parish income. Uh, it's all about money, I'm afraid. <clears throat> um, and they managed to persuade, uh, the bishops eventually managed to persuade the king to abandon the idea of abolishing that practice. And so the tithing of churches for the benefit of bishops continues to today. The next person we need to know about is a man called Richard Bancroft. He was the archbishop in waiting um, and he was one of the most relentless opponents of Puritanism in England. In a famous sermon preached in St Paul's Cathedral, at St Paul's Cross, rather, he declared that the Puritans were false prophets. 
Wow. Uh, the news of James VI of Scotland would succeed Elizabeth caused Bancroft considerable anguish. It's because he, under, he, th he thought he knew that he would be a strong Protestant. And his suspicion was that James would convert England to Presbyterianism and sweep away all the bishops, including himself. That's what he thought that he would do. So his, 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 his strategy for coping with James was very simple. He would persuade James that the monarchy was dependent upon the bishops. And without bishops, there was no future for the monarchy in England. That's what he would do. And what this would do, by linking the two concepts, it would mean that James would come out in favour of the bishops. Elizabeth had never taken the view that the survival of the English crown based upon bishops, but Bancroft talked up the idea and persuaded James that that was the case, and that if he wanted to remain king, he would have to keep the bishops. So he argued that the king's real enemies were either papists or they were puritans and each one of them had an had a interest in destroying his authority as king right now lancelot andrews would play a key role in the preparation of the king james bible um, and he had a long <laughs> he had two special verses in the old testament which told him um, that he had to be the person. You know, how, how anybody can misinterpret scripture to, to fulfill these things is very, very difficult. But it's amazing what people do do. They do do these things. It's amazing. Now, Bancroft's first major success was it was in the aftermath of James's hasty promise to the Puritans to abolish the inappropriate tithes. In the event um, James decided not to implement this a somewhat pre precipitate decision uh, to end the tithing practice. In October the 22nd, 1603, James proclaimed a proclamation stating that he had convened a conference to be attended by himself, by the Privy Council and various bishops and other learned men and to deal with these issues at the Palace of Hampton Court in January of the following year. This conference was to prove decisively decisive importance in the bringing about of the King James Bible. Yet it was unquestionably a tactical blunder, uh, one that alarmed the bishops and created false hopes for the Puritans. So the Puritans weren't getting what they want and the bishops weren't getting all what they want. So it was tactically not a great decision at all. Uh, the English Parliament was now dominated by Puritans, which gave them a major influence over English public life. So what could be done? Well, James summoned 10 of his senior bishops to explain to them what he proposed. The Hampton Court Conference would be convened for the reformation of some things amiss in ecclesiastical matters. Now, the conference was heavily weighted towards the established church. The Archbishop of Canterbury was joined by the bishops of Carlisle, Chichester, Durham, London, Peterborough, St David's, Winchester and Worcester. The six cathedral deans presented including the Dean of Westminster Abbey, St Paul's Cathedral. When the King's Privy Council is taken into account there were 19 representatives of the establishment. 19 but only four Puritans were invited to attend. That's shocking, isn't it? The four Puritans that were invited to attend were um, John Reynolds, who was a president of Corpus Christi College, Oxford, uh, Lawrence Chatterton, master of Emmanuel College, Cambridge, known for his Puritan sympathies. There was John Newscombs, fellow of St. John's College, Cambridge, and Thomas Spark, Minister of Bletchley in Buckinghamshire. Those are the only four. Okay, So it was a terribly uh, unbalanced conference. The conference opened on Saturday the 24th, sorry, Saturday the 14th of January, with what observer of terms a very admirable speech, an hour long at least, made by the King himself. He was very clear 
that he saw himself as king and having a decisive role in the affairs of the church. Now I could read extracts of his um, long um, uh, his long sermon, but I won't do that. Uh, it must be it must be noted that James noted the substantial achievement of Elizabeth in settling the religious profile of England and hinted they had no particular concern to change matters unnecessarily. You see, James was going to confirm what was already settled. There, there were a number of issues to talk about. The first one was the question of the book of common prayer. This was the this was the order of service that was to be used in every uh, church in the Church of England. Second, there was excommunication in the in ecclesiastical courts. That was an issue that had to be um, settled. And the third was the providing for fit and able ministers in Ireland. It's important to note that there was no mention of any proposal for a new translation of the Bible. That wasn't on the agenda at all. Um, one of the big issues that came up was this question of um, um, in the prayer book, the, the, the words were stated, with my body, I thee worship. This came out of the marriage ceremony. Um, and uh, John Reynolds argued that only God is the one that ought to be worshipped. It was a strange thing, really. It's amazing what people do discuss when they come into, into a conference like this. Um, but uh, James just squashed the idea and said, no, no, it's not the same type of worship. Not, it's, not, it's not an issue. So that was, that was completely dealt with. Um, the, next, the next thing that came out, which was really quite um, extraordinary, was uh, that the second day of the conference, was the great issue that the doctrine of the church might be preserved in purity according to God's word. The second issue is that good pastors might be planted in all churches to preach the same. The fourth issue was that church government might be sincerely administered according to God's word and that the book of common prayer might be fitted to more increase of piety. So it was clear that the basic Puritan demand was of for either the abolition of the prayer book or at least a significant relaxation of what they regarded as its more unbiblical demands. No reasons were given to suppose that there was any great demand within Puritanism for a new English translation of the Bible. The Puritan agenda on the matter of English Bibles was limited to a hope that the Geneva Bible would be authorised to be used in churches. Now, the abolition of radical modifications of the prayer book would lead to a new period of religious infighting within his realm, a, a thing which he wanted to avoid at all cost. Um, so the Puritan demands had been resisted at every single point. Okay. He wasn't enthusiastic about authorising the Geneva Bible. James regarded it as the worst of all versions. Um, so the Puritans had actually attended the conference and gained nothing. They'd got nothing. They hadn't got anything whatsoever. And so the king was looking for a gesture. He was looking for something that he could give them, which would make them happy. Okay. Now, the breakthrough came when John Reynolds, the leader of the small Puritan delegation, proposed a new Bible translation. It was not clear where the proposal came from, nor what was the underlying motive. On account of the meeting, um, they said that only one translation of the Bible could, should be declared authentic and to be read in churches. They didn't want the the, the Geneva Bible. So Reynolds might have expected his proposal for the Geneva Bible to be read in churches to have failed, thus allowing him to make the apparently lesser request that the Geneva Bible should simply be the one of a number of translations authorised for use in public worship, um, in addition or instead of the Bishop's Bible. Now, Bishop Bancroft, who acted as the leader of the Anglican uh, 
contingent throughout the conference and had opposed virtually everything that Reynolds suggested, he said, a new translation? Why not? And that was the decision. James saw his opening. He was a major concession he could make without causing any pressing difficulties to anyone. A translation of this magnitude would take time. So he, would not, he, he was not committing himself to anything with major short-term implications. The longer the translation took, the better. It would postpone religious controversy to an indeterminate point in the future. He concurred immediately with the suggestion. James declared that he had yet to see a Bible well translated into English, ignoring the fact that the Geneva Bible was exactly what that was. And he offered his opinion that the Geneva Bible is the worst of all. <laughs> so, now the, it's interesting to note that at this particular time in history, the Dewey Reims translation had many parallels with the Geneva Bible. Both had their origins within the community of English scholars that were outside of England. And both of them um, were actually excellent translations. The Dewey Reims translation had its origins within the Roman Catholic community uh, from England on account of the equally hostile religious policies of the Protestant Queen Elizabeth. But the Geneva Bible was also produced outside of England by the people who escaped the persecution under Mary. So the English College at Dewey was founded in 1568 and temporarily migrated to Reims for the period of uh, 85 to 93. The translation was undertaken by Gregory Martin, although Martin translated both the Old and New Testaments, it was the New Testament that was published in 1682. The translation was based on the Latin, Latin Vulgate rather than the Greek original. And it was the Council of Trent okay, that, that we owe to this decision. It was a Council of Trent that decided to produce um, a Bible which would counter the effect of the Reformation. It was the Counter-Reformation Bible. The only biblical text that, is, that was authorised for Roman Catholics to use. Now the Dewey Reims Bible therefore would pose a threat to the Geneva Bible and to the Bishop's Bible. It's one thing, if there was one thing that united Anglicans and Puritans, it was a shared dislike and fear of Roman Catholicism. James thus directed that the best learned in both universities at this stage should take on this responsibility. Now England at that time only had two universities, they had Oxford and Cambridge and they should begin work on this new translation. Now the decision to print, uh, it was the, um, sorry let me just say, the decision to proceed with a new translation of the Bible was the most important and some would say the only positive decision taken at the Hampton Court Conference, the explicit royal stipulation that all forms of annotation would be excluded, ensured that the difficulties created by the establishment by the Geneva Bible would be avoided, or at any rate, it was thought that they would be avoided. Uh, the vestments of the, of the Church of England against Catholics on the one hand and Puritans on the other became a separate issue. Um, so uh, we come right the way down and um, to support the new translation would be to win royal favour. So everybody crowded around. They all wanted to be supporters of the King James Bible. Uh, uh, Bishop of London, Bancroft, was well placed to make sure that the translators were appointed as soon as possible and that the long arduous translation progress would begin. He personally wrote to the bishops of the Church of England in July 1606, making sure that the translators would be financially supported during their labours. Um, and this is because the king had no money. At this particular time, the king was in debt to um, £600,000, which in today's money was probably like six million, six billion rather, a huge sum. Um, in the meanwhile, uh, 
James I, 1604 to 1611. Uh, James wrote an, an interesting book. <laughs> A counterblast to tobacco. A counterblast to tobacco. And when you go through these uh, historical notes, you find that the most absurd things are said. Most absurd. First of all, uh, tobacco was welcomed as a means of spirituality. Can you understand that? It was said that when you, you blew the smoke, you were having a liberating spiritual experience. <laughs> but then he then turned against it on medical grounds saying that the smoke, let me read what he says. First, it is thought uh, by you a sure aphorism in the administration of medicine that the brains of all men will naturally are naturally cold and wet, all dry and hot things should be good for them, by which nature, by which nature this sinking samification is and therefore of good use to them. Now, what he's saying is that men are naturally cold and that smoking is naturally hot and so it's going to be good for you. The second thing is, the second argument showed that uh, this filthy smoke, as well as the heat and the strength thereof, as by a natural force and quality, is able and fit to purge both the head and the stomach of rheums and distillations, as experience teaches, by the spitting and avoiding phlegm immediately after the taking of it. So what he was doing, basically, he was coming down against the use of, of tobacco however one cannot help but notice that this tobacco was coming from the um, it was coming from the Spanish colonies and there was an effort to try to avoid um, purchasing from the Spanish col colonies if I can read the, the last little bit of his treatise he says scorned and held in contempt a custom loathsome to the eye hateful to the nose harmful to the brain dangerous to the lungs in the black stinking fume thereof was nearest resembling the horrible stygian smoke of the pit that is bottomless you know these men knew how to talk <laughs> he was against smoking um now at this particular time uh, the, the the king james the royal court was six hundred thousand pounds in debt in 1604 and this precarious position okay meant that james could not contribute any money to he couldn't pay for the bishops to do the work and he couldn't pay for any of the copies to be made so by royal decree every parish had to supply money to produce your own copy he didn't have any money now his foreign policy didn't go down well either as a nation he'd come to regard hostility with spain as part of his national identity and Roman Catholicism was the glue that prevented at least for a while Puritans and Anglicans from pursuing open warfare with each other you see uh, Richard Bancroft um, who had been appointed Archbishop of Canterbury in October 1606 saw himself as a vigorous defender of the Church of England and identified its two chief enemies as potentially resurgent Puritanism and persistent Catholicism. So for 50 years, he tried, he, he, for 50 years, he opposed both and he issued the Constitutions and Canons Ecclesiastical in 1604, designed to enforce the authority of the bishops and the use of the prayer books. Let me just say exactly what this was meaning. This was meaning that if you held a church service and you didn't use the prayer book, you could be arrested and jailed indefinitely. Not only that, but if you didn't use the prayer book, then you couldn't hold a marriage, you couldn't hold a funeral, you couldn't have a christening. Okay? So this was a stranglehold upon the people of England. Um, and everything was all about subservient to the crown now the anti-catholic sentiment became inflamed in 1605 through the failure of the gunpowder plot that year the official account of the events was that there was a plot to blow up the house of lords on the november the 5th when the king was due to present to be present to open proceedings alerted by the plot in advance the authorities were able to thwart the conspiracy and arrest the perpetrators 
all the prominent Catholics, every single one. Eight conspirators were executed in January 1606. Henry Garnet, a Jesuit, was executed outside St. Paul's Cathedral in March on the grounds that he had knowledge of a plot. This had been a, 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 this had more tangible relevance, relevance to our story. It is urged to account. He was urged to account by John Overall, Dean of St. Paul's Cathedral, and having failed to do so, Overall witnessed Garnet being hanged, drawn and quartered. Overall was, as we, as we shall see, a member of one of the companies of the translators appointed to oversee the production of the King James Version. Further concerns were expressed over the King's own increasingly obvious homosexual tendencies, which led to certain royal favours being granted that were subject to much comment and envy. Robert Carr, some 20 years younger than James, was one such favourite. He became Earl Somerset in 1613, although James fondled and kissed his favourites in what was widely regarded as a lecherous manner, in public, in court, the court was prepared to believe that his private behaviour was somewhat more restrained. The commissioning of the new translation of the Bible was one of the first positive acts of the new King of England. Uh, by this but by the time of its final appearance in 1611, James's popularity had waned substantially. People, uh, people began to long for the good old days of Queen Elizabeth, with whom James was regularly compared unfavourably. There was no doubt that what James wanted to achieve during his reign, it was a unified Protestant England, unified around a free translation of the Bible, James had every reason to hope that his new translation of the Bible would be a powerful factor in creating a cohesive English national identity, especially over and against Roman Catholicism, which was enjoying a newfound strength and stability in Europe. The new Bible would be a rallying point for the Protestant national nation. The production at the King's initiative of a new translation of the Bible would reinforce the image of the king as the political and spiritual leader of his country. The unity of king and Bible and church would ensure the unity of the English people and might even stimulate rebirth of the elusive sense of national identity and pride that had blossomed under Elizabeth. Much, it seemed, would depend upon the translation. So next time we're going to look about we're going to look at how the translation work was actually done. What were the conditions, what were the rules, and how did they go about it? So we look forward to catching up with you on our next episode. Have a great day, everybody. Don't forget to like and share. That will be really good. God bless you. Bye for now.